Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a great privilege and honor for me to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Sir Michael Marmot. Sir Michael Marmot has led research groups on health inequalities for over 35 years. He was chair of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which was set up by the World Health Organization in 2005, and produced the report, Closing the Gap in a Generation in 2008. At the request of the British government, he conducted a strategic review of health inequalities of England past 2010, which published its report, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, at that time. Following this, he chaired the European Review of Social Determinants of Health and the Health Divide for WHO Euro. He leads the English Longitudinal Study of Aging and is engaged in several international research efforts on the social determinants of health. He served as president of the British Medical Association 2010 to 11 and is the new president of the British Lung Foundation. He's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, an honorary fellow of the British Academy and an honorary fellow of the Faculty of Public Health of the Royal College of Physicians. He was a member of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution for six years, and in 2000, he was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen for services to epidemiology and the understandings of health inequalities. We're all envious of that knighting, <laughs> Sir Michael. Internationally acclaimed, Professor Marmot is a foreign associate member of the Institute of Medicine, and a former vice president of the Academia Europea. He, of course, has many, many honors and has been awarded a Harvard Lowndes partnership, professorship for 2014 to 17. With a keen wit and a gentle manner, Professor Marmot is also a fierce champion in shining the spotlight on the social determinants of health and will leverage that when he becomes president of the World Medical Association later this year. This morning, he will shine the spotlight on violence as a social determinant of health. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sir Michael Marmot. What a pleasure to be here, but mixed with the understanding that it is a grisly topic that we are here to discuss. My approach to this is not just that gender-based violence is a social determinant of health, but the social determinants of health are also social determinants of violence. So I want to situate gender-based violence within the general context of the social determinants of health. I have a confession to make. I am not the least bit modern, but <laughs> two colleagues whose combined age was about two-thirds of mine <laughs> said, you have to start tweeting. <laughs> I have. Uh, I'm a Twitter virgin, but I have started uh, two months ago, so there you are, just in case. <laughs> As Dr. Lazarus said, we launched the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health in 2008, somewhat unusually for a WHO publication. We said social injustice is killing on a grand scale. Social justice is a matter of life and death. When we were doing the commission, and since, people have said to me, no government will take you seriously unless you can make the economic case. And I said, if there's an economic case for taking action on health inequalities, inequities, fine. But our case is the moral case. The reason for taking action on avoidable health inequalities is because they are wrong. And if we can put them right by social action, we have a moral responsibility to take that action. And I would say the same about gender-based violence. And we said that we wanted to empower 
individuals, communities, and indeed whole countries. And we saw empowerment as having three dimensions. Material, if you don't have the resources to feed your children, you can't be empowered. Psychosocial, having control over your life. And political, having voice. You will have heard voices that say, isn't health a matter of personal responsibility? And my response is, of course it is a matter of personal responsibility, but we have to create the conditions that enable people to take control of their lives. Empowerment isn't just an individual characteristic. It comes from the society. And so we said we need to tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources. These are fundamental. And as you heard in the wake of the WHO Commission, I produced the so-called Marmot Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives in England. This was most unusual. We were commissioned by a Labour government, and soon after I produced my report, the government changed, and we had a Conservative-led coalition government. The question was, what would happen to my report? Would this be seen as some sort of vaguely left of center social democracy? The conservative-led coalition government issued a public health white paper, said this is the government's response to Sir Michael Marmot's review. We have to put reduction of health inequalities at the center of our public health strategy. We will not solve this through the healthcare system alone, but we need action on the wider determinants of health. People said to me, they didn't mean it. <laughs> and my response was, there's far more chance of their doing it if they've written it down and said it than not. Now, as I'll say, there's a lot more we could be doing. We did the European review, and we're working in many other countries. So these were the six recommendations of my English review, and they were rather similar to the European review. Give every child the best start in life. Education and lifelong learning. Employment and working conditions. Number four was really radical. In a rich country, every person should have the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. The fifth, healthy and sustainable places to live and work. Thank you. And not forgetting prevention, but taking a social determinants approach to prevention. You notice we said nothing about the healthcare system. We are blessed still, it's under threat, but we are blessed with universal access to healthcare free at the point of use. The Commonwealth Fund shows that the National Health Service in Britain is the most equitable, best performing healthcare system in the world, out of 11 countries. Number one, our health is number 10 out of 11. So it's not because of lack of health care, it's because of the way we organize our affairs in society. You're probably wondering which country was number 11 out of 11 in health. I'm sorry to break this to you. Um, <laughs> so let's start with uh, give every child the best start in life. There are two approaches. One is to look at the conditions in which children are raised, and the second is to take specific action. These are uh, UNICEF figures looking at country rankings and equality in child well-being based on material conditions, education, and health. The usual suspects are at the top, Denmark, Finland, Netherlands, Switzerland, UK has got to be somewhere here. Oh my gosh. We're down at number five. Um, way, way down. But I do like coming to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> it is the one big country that makes me feel halfway decent about my own. 
And as I said to colleagues last night, whenever I get disgruntled about the quality of our political debate in Britain, I just look across the Atlantic. <laughs> so what about the social and economic conditions in which children are raised? These figures are looking at child poverty defined as less than 50% median income. The US child poverty level is higher than in Latvia. I showed this slide at a big meeting of the American Public Health Association a year or so ago. And I said to them, you live in a democracy. This must be the level of child poverty that you want. Otherwise, you'd vote in a government that did something different. What are you doing? <laughs> Afterwards, someone said to me, do you think you'll get asked back? <laughs> so we need to set the conditions in which our children are raised. If you look at the social gradient in early child development by some measure of deprivation, the right wing politically would say it's poor parenting. The left would say it's poverty. And they're both correct. The conditions in which we raise our children impact on the quality of parenting. So we need to look at parenting and family support, perinatal services, <laughs> preschool education, care, and education. Look at these figures from Britain. This is the percent of children that are read to every day age three by a measure of status. In this case it's income, quintiles of income. Now when we were doing the English review it was put to me that we were going to be reporting into an adverse economic climate. Here's a really expensive intervention read to your children. And it follows the social gradient. Reading, playing, talking, cuddling, all those things that we think of as good parenting follow the social gradient. 20% of mothers of children age three in the bottom quintile claim that it is not important to cuddle a child is there any experience in the world more rewarding than cuddling a child? And 20% of women in the bottom quintile deny that it's important to cuddle a child or to talk to a child. And that has, of course, dramatic impact on the development of children. Now, I'm working on the assumption, given that everything I look at is a gradient, I'm working on the assumption that adverse child experience are one end of the spectrum of good early child development. There's not bad things and then everybody else is good. There's a gradient so that we can look at what we understand about the determinants of good early child development and I think make a reasonable supposition that adverse child experiences are one end of that. So if we look at inequalities in cognitive development for reading and mathematics, at age seven, you can see that there's not one thing that relates to poor performance, but low birth weight, not being breastfed, maternal depression, having a lone parent, median family income less than 60%, parental unemployment. These are all the kinds of things that we think of as adverse child experiences that relate to poor development on maths and reading which are going to prejudice that child's whole life course. What happens to them in school, further training in education, work, and the like. So moving on to adverse child experiences, how many adults in England have suffered each ACE? And these figures are not terribly different to those you'd see in the United States. 
9% of adults in England had four or more adverse child experiences. 48% had at least one. And those who do have adverse child experiences, four or more, are more likely to binge drink and have a poor diet, more likely to be a smoker, more likely to have had sex under 16 years old, more likely to have had or caused an unplanned teenage pregnancy, be involved in violence in the last year, and more likely to have used heroin, crack, or been incarcerated. We're setting the life course by what happens in early childhood. And as I've tried to say, that should be set in the broader context of what we're doing about poverty and disadvantage. So preventing ACE, could we reduce the frequency of adverse child experiences? We could cut early sex by a third, unintended teen pregnancy by 38%, smoking by 16%, binge drinking by 15%, cannabis, heroin crack use, violence by 51%, and violence perpetration by 52%. And this phenomenon that I do not pretend to understand about these intergenerational cycles, someone who's been, who's been abused is more likely as an adult to be abused. Someone who's been abused as a child, usually a male, is more likely to be a perpetrator. How these intergen, is it deprivation? Is it lack of opportunity? Is it some culture of violence? I don't pretend to understand it, but it's chilling. And when we look at uh, the prevalence of adverse child experiences, by deprivation, we see the social gradient. The more deprived, the more likely are people to have experienced each of these adverse child experiences. So while it's possible to have an adverse child experience if you're in a rich family, it's far more likely, increasingly so, as you go down the social gradient. And these are US figures looking uh, what we just heard from CDC, looking at the consequences of, a whole, of ACEs on a whole range of disturbances, including this one, the relative odds of perpetuating intimate partner violence in adulthood by the number of adverse child experiences. So it perpetuates through the life course. Look at annual number of deaths. Let's look at the tip of the iceberg. Deaths from maltreatment in children under 15 in rich countries in 2003. Spain at the bottom. Mexico vies with the United States at the top. What are you doing? I was asked last night at dinner what I thought about inequality as a key issue for discussion in the US. And my response was, what more important issue can there be? This will tear the society apart, whether it be racial inequality, socioeconomic inequality, gender inequality, this will tear the society apart. And here's the kind of evidence. Global prevalence, one in three women globally will experience physical and or sexual violence. So your point about Ebola is well taken. This is a bigger issue in terms of the global prevalence. It is a public health issue. 35% of women suffer from it. 42% of those women experience injuries. 38% of all murdered women globally, are murdered by partners. 6% of murdered men. I can hardly bear to show you this next set of figures. 
in different countries, the percent of married women who believe that her husband is justified to beat her if she refuses to have sex. In Mali, for women with no education, 60% of women endorse that proposition. Now, it varies by country. But the point of hope is look at the difference by education. Education of women is empowering. One of the things we said in the Global Commission is the single most important thing we can do for global health is empowerment of women and education is a vital ingredient. <laughs> and when we look at spousal violence by educational level in country after country, we see what we saw on that previous slide. The more education, the less likely are women to have experienced spousal violence. Now, whether it's because the men are more educated or whether because empowered women can stand up for themselves, an interesting and important question. But the fact is, education appears to be vital. And in the US, if we look at domestic violence by income, we see this staggeringly steep gradient. The lower the income, the more frequent is domestic violence. And these are the health outcomes related to intimate partner violence. Suicide, right at the top of the list, induced abortion, unipolar depressive disorder, alcohol use disorder. Domestic violence is a health issue. So not only do the social determinants of health overlap with the social determinants of domestic violence, but having been subject to it, there are damaging effects on health. And men and women with mental health disorders across all diagnoses are more likely to have experienced domestic violence. And they're more likely to have reported, uh, to have experienced violence if they're married at a young age have multiple children and a family history, which we've just been looking at. But there are things you can do. I really like this trial from South Africa. There was, it was a trial of women who were enrolled in a microfinance scheme, so small loans to conduct their own economic activities. But in the context of that microfinance scheme, there was a trial. Half the women were enrolled in supportive communities of women, and the other half were not, the control group. In the first year, there was a 55% reduction in intimate partner violence in the treatment group, but not in the control group. Regrettably, there was no effect on unprotected sex, and in that year, no effect on HIV incidence. But there was a dramatic fall in intimate partner violence. And it's, to me, it seems the combination of women being able to support themselves, that's part of being empowered, and having a support group of women could say, we will not put up with this. It doesn't have to be like this with this dramatic improvement in their lives. It's funny, isn't it? Being involved in health, they're not talking about the goal of blood pressure reduction or weight reduction, but talking about dignity, respect. What we heard before I came up was about being treated with dignity and respect and respect for your rights. And education of boys as well as girls is going to be vital. Peer learning from men and women. Identify and protect those in vulnerable circumstances. And then, of course, community health services and access to justice. What about doctors and health professionals? I've said a great deal about the social determinants. 
do doctors and health professionals have a role in social determinants of health? We produced a report in Britain, and one of my goals for my presidency of the World Medical Association is to try and do something similar for the, at the global level. Try and get doctors engaged in the issue of health equity and what they can do on social determinants of health. And we said there were five areas. Workforce education and training, working with individuals in their community context, the health service as employer, conditions of work for people who work in the health service, and also the impact of the health service as employer on the local community, working in partnership, cross-sector working, and the workforce as advocates, standing up for the rights of your patients and the populations that you serve. Watch this space, see if I manage to make any progress with the World Medical Association. <laughs> um, it's a challenge, but why not? <laughs> Proportionate universalism. What do I mean by that? I had an experience at Her Majesty's Treasury, our Ministry of Finance, when they were planning Sure Start. Sure Start was based on Head Start, the idea that we should give children the best start in life. And I was invited to a consultation meeting when they were starting it. And I showed the social gradient in early child development, in education, and in a whole variety of other measures. Now they were planning Sure Start to focus on the most deprived. And I said, but it's a social gradient. Don't just look at the very bottom. Those who are second from the bottom are doing worse than those who are third from the bottom all the way up. And this economist at Her Majesty's Treasury said, oh, don't come to me with this Scandinavian nonsense. <laughs> We're Anglo-Saxons, he said. <laughs> Actually, he was Irish-Jewish, but we'll leave that aside. <laughs> We're Anglo-Saxons. We focus. That's what we do. We focus on the most deprived. We spend the resources where it'll do the most good. And I had a, a meeting with an Irish minister of health, and she said to me, almost quoting the British Treasury, I want to spend the money where it'll do the most good. And I said, spend it on the middle classes. <gasps> she was shocked. I said, well, that's what all the evidence shows. For a given quantum of expenditure, the amount of health gain is bigger for the more advantaged. People who are richer and have better health and better education respond better to whatever you give them than people who are disadvantaged. So you want to spend the money where it'll do the most good. Spend it on the people who, who already are more advantaged. I was skating on thin ice here. Um, <laughs> she was shocked and then she said, but that's not what I came into politics to do. I came into politics to help people who are the most disadvantaged. I said, aha. You have an equity principle, not just an efficiency principle. I would vote for you. <laughs> so we've got these two ideas, the Scandinavian nonsense, the Nordic idea of universalist approaches, and focus on the worst off. Well, with classic British compromise, when I did my English review, I talked about proportionate universalism. The idea that we want universalist solutions. A health system for the poor is a poor health system. An education system for the poor is a poor education system. We want to bring people into the mainstream. We don't want excluded people who are treated in some special way. We want everybody to enjoy what the population has which parenthetically is one of the reasons why inequality is such a bad thing, because the people at the top don't want to be with the hoi polloi. 
They want to make their own solutions. So the way we tried to solve this was to talk about proportionate universalism. Universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. After all, that's what the National Health Service is. If you've got diabetes and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and heart failure, a lot more is spent on you than if you don't have those things. Most of us would like never to use the health service and we feel that was pretty good. But if we have lots of conditions, we want more effort proportionate to need. Let me finish with what we said in our European review for WHO. Now Europe, in WHO terms, is the whole of the former Soviet Union. So it's Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan and goodness knows whatever Stan. It, <laughs> all the way um, to the Bering Strait. So there are some countries whose health records would not look out of place in sub-Saharan Africa. And we said, if you're doing nothing on social determinants of health, do something. It would make a difference. If you're doing things and you're making progress, do more. And if you're Sweden and Norway, do it better. <laughs> I'd say there's something here for all of us. Do something, do more, do better.